All right, perfect. So, hi everyone. Welcome to tonight's Zoom. Uh, I am Alina Conley, uh, Ambassador Diamond, and I am super excited because it's been a while since we've had a guest speaker um, kind of coming on and sharing their story. And so, I was telling the team um, on our Facebook page that I had actually watched a video from when you did a team, I mean, a team Zoom for Alyssa's team. And I was just blown away from your story, um, so much so that I just had to get on a one-on-one -on -one with you, um, but then, of course, invite you on to our team's call. Um, and uh, we also wanted to just extend a warm welcome from our family, and we call ourselves the Young and Free. And so a warm Young and Free welcome, um, as you have recently joined the It Works family. So if you could just kind of, you know, kick it off, give us a little background, um, tell us, you know, how long you've been in the industry, what brought you to It Works and kind of a little bit about your story. Okay, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. I tell you, I've uh, read your story as well. So congratulations on all your success and all your leaders. Um, I'm excited to be a part of the It Works family. I have been in the industry actually since I was 17. Um, I lied on an application <laughs> so that I could get started with the company and work with my girlfriend. So I, I just knew from the very beginning um, that I love this industry. The idea of being able to take charge of your own future, your own finances, your own, you know, just your own life in a way that, you know, I hadn't seen from the people that were around me. Most of you are probably like me. My parents were both teachers, um, you know, so they always taught me, you know, you grow up, you get a good job, you know, you know, get an education, you get a good job. And I tell you, it was really tough for them when I decided not to do all that, not to do it in that manner. But I actually... Um, got married and I have three daughters and I have grandkids now also. As a matter of fact, you know, let me just go ahead and excuse them now. They live in Florida. So, you know, the first batch of evacuees have arrived at my house. Um, so they're a little noisy in the background. But I found myself in a situation where I thought there was going to be a separation and a divorce. And it was, t it was particularly tough because I was a Girl Scout cookie mom. You know, we had the Kool-Aid house where, you know, everybody knew their kids could come hang out, be safe, have fun. And so when I realized that things were changing, I had to go get a job. I just did not want to sit there and wait for the entire thing to break apart and find myself in a position where I couldn't take care of my kids. So I got a job in a law firm and I was working in that law firm, sometimes 50, 60 hours a week. So when the separation happened um, and he left and took his six figure income with him, I found myself in a position where I had to provide for these three kids and we had, you know, a really good lifestyle. We had the nice house, the, you know, the nice cars, the great vacations, and now we had no income to go with it. So I was trying to figure out how do I replace a hundred thousand dollars plus of income a year. So I was working. I mean, I was going to that law firm faithfully and it was so frustrating because there were times I'd be packing up, you know, leaving to go home and then realize I had to stay. You know, they needed me to do something or finish up something for a case the next day. And that was super frustrating because I wanted to be with my kids. I really, really miss being with my children, especially since, you know, I was that Girl Scout cookie mom. So I did what I had to do or what I felt like I had to do as opposed to what I was created to do. And you know, that creates that unsettling inside of you. It just kind of feels like a knot in your chest. And I just remember going home in taxi cabs and crying because I knew when I got home, my kids were going to be asleep. They were going to already be in bed. You know, we faxed homework back and forth at times. And you know, I had sick kids and they wouldn't let me go be with my sick kids, so to speak. You know, I had to leave and you know, just deal with whatever the repercussions were. So I remembered this industry um, and I was like, well, what can I do to replace at least $500 a month so I don't have to work so much overtime. So I can at least get back home with my kids. And I was introduced to a company by a family member. Now we all have that family member that we respect as a person, right? But in terms of respecting them in business, not so much, right? I love him as a man, but I wasn't gonna follow him in any business because I'd done it before and lost money. So. When he came to tell me about the business, I was like, I was too busy. I didn't want to hear it. I wouldn't take his phone calls. You know, he brought a package to my house, left it in my front door. I took it, put it back in his front door. Um, and I just would not even listen to him. And it wasn't until we were at a family event that I was playing, we were playing spades. He was at the table over there and I overheard him telling a story. 
And he talked about a gentleman who had been involved with this company for a short period of time and was making a tremendous income. He was purchasing these types of investment homes. He was doing all of these things that the, um, that the industry was affording him to do. I was like, well, what is his background? And he looked at me, he's like, you don't want to hear about this. I said, no, I asked you a question. Like, and I need you to tell me now, like, what's his background? He said, well, he's a mailman. So I was sitting here like the mailman is making that kind of money. I need to meet this mailman. And so he set it up and I sat down with that gentleman and I'm just really, you know, I'm kind of a, a pretty much of a straight shooter, always have been. And I remember I looked at him and, you know, the two of them were at the table and I said, look, I'll do this if you agree to work with me because I, I can't work with him like that. And he agreed. So I signed up that day, got the service and, you know, got into that business. But remember me, I was busy. I had two kids, I mean, three kids, I'm sorry, I left somebody out. I had three kids, you know, I'm the only child of a, of my mom who's flat out spoiled. She was very supportive, but she also expected some things from me. Um, I had full-time or it seemed like full-time responsibilities at church. So I didn't have any time to like go figure it out. So what did I do? What anybody would do? I just went back to my life the way I was accustomed to living it. And I thank God that that leader had the foresight to pick up the phone and call me and say, how are you? How are things going? I got some time on Saturday. Let's go get you qualified. I'm like, I didn't even know what that meant. I was like, what does it mean to be qualified? He said, let's get you paid. Paid is good. What do I need to do? And he said, just put me in front of some people and we will go. We'll see them. You'll learn while you're earned. We'll do some training in the car in between appointments. And then we'll get in front of those folks and we'll, see, and we'll just create some income for you. And that's what I did. I just made some phone calls. And I, you know, I always tell people, like, I'm coming, he's coming with me. They're like, well, tell me about it. I was like, I don't know. That's why I'm bringing him. He's going to tell us both, right? Because I was ignorance on fire. Like, literally, I just knew I needed to change my life. And I trusted this leader to help me to do that. And I, we did that. And at the end of that day, I had earned over $1,100 that first day. Wow. Now, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> but I did know that if I could earn $1,100 on a Saturday, in about six hours, what could I do if I did six hours every day working for myself from home? So I set a goal and I said, I'm gonna achieve this, the top position in this company. I'll be the first single parent ever to have this position. I'm gonna do it in 90 days. And I went to work. I literally had to sit my kids down and have a conversation with them because I knew I could not do it without them. I didn't want to leave them behind. I didn't want them to feel like I was leaving them behind. So I got everybody involved. I was like, this is team us. We're going to make this happen for us. And I painted a picture for them of what it was going to look like. We had dream boards. We had pictures all around the wall of what we wanted to do once this, this position was achieved and what certain, um, when certain levels of income were achieved. And it's funny because I find a lot of times people use the reason that they start doing a business in this industry, they use that as the reason why they stop, like the excuse why they quit. Meaning, for instance, I started this business really because I wanted to feed my kids and put a roof over their heads, right? And then still have time to spend with them. Well, when those kids start whining about you going to yet another event, why do you have to go again? Why? Then people say, well, I can't because I feel guilty. But that's exactly why you have to go. You have to go, one, because you told your kids you were going to change your life. And a lot of times they hate the business that we're doing is because we haven't been honest with them, right? Mm -hmm. We say we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and these are going to be the outcomes, yet they come home from school, and we're doing the same thing we've always done with the remote control, watching Power or Empire or whatever it is, that's one of these days, right? So now they're looking at us like, okay, your work ethic, you're not even doing what you said you were going to do, but you want me to believe in this vision, this dream that you keep. This, it's a pipe dream at that point. So you kind of lose their support. It was very important to me that I had their support. Because again, remember, their lives had already been shaken up and I didn't want them to have to be shaken up any further. So I got them involved. My oldest daughter, I said, look, this is what we're going to do. This is the goal. This is what it looks like when we achieve the goal. But I need your help. We've got to do this together. And my oldest daughter, she made sure that my young, to help my youngest daughter with her homework, to make sure that everybody's homework was done. My middle daughter, she was in charge of food. If there's not food for y'all to eat and then you leave a grocery list, I'll go in the middle of the night, whatever it takes. But for a season, for a period of time, I have to really, really grind to make this happen. And my little daughter, my youngest daughter, I think she was about six at the time, it was funny. She's like, well, what do I do? What do I do? So I had her putting labels on brochures. 
not because I could ever use those brochures, but because I needed to make sure she felt like she was involved. And then whenever I had to go, I had a meeting jar. So I would put money in this jar so that on a certain date that we had decided, that's when we would go take that jar. And that was just super quality time with them. We're going to spend this money any way that you want to spend it. So they always knew what was going on. They were always a part of it. So they didn't have any opportunity to really feel left out. And it's ironic. It was really ironic because I would hear things that they said to other people, like my sister, she's like, she's, not my, she's a play sister. Um, I don't know if you can call her a play sister after 30 years, but she, she said to my daughter, she said, your mom has gone again because I was traveling a lot. Your mom has gone again. And she said, oh, she'll be back. You know, and then my, my oldest daughter was always just kind of like, okay, what else do we need to do? And it was really, you know, and I let people borrow my kids' stories all the time. Because if you are a single parent or if you just, you, maybe you're married and you have young kids and you're feeling that mom guilt about leaving them so that you can build this business, remember why you're doing it is a better life. So when my kids, my oldest daughter tells the story of how she didn't really, she wasn't sure about it. She would hear me on conference calls. She didn't understand what I was saying. She didn't understand what everybody else was saying, but I was excited. They were excited. So she was excited, right? So still at that time, my office was in a closet in my master bedroom. And so she would just kind of be like, I don't know what's going on, but I trust my mom. So I, they just ran with it. And then she said she started to see the food in the refrigerator start changing. It wasn't as much box stuff and, you know, processed stuff, but it was more fresh foods. And she said that, you know, we started going out to dinner after church on Sundays. And she talked about how she saw us transform. You know, we didn't vacation at grandma's house anymore. We actually went somewhere and our lives really started to, to transform. And she looked at me and she said to me, and this changed, like this, this settled it for me. She said, thank you for having the courage to say yes when everybody else told you to say no. Because everybody told me it could never work. It was like, even my ex-husband, he was like, it will never work, you'll never make any money. And instead of me believing him, I decided to use that as the fuel, as a reason why I had to make it work. People in our lives that are telling us all of the reasons why we'll never be successful. But instead of believing them, trust your own belief in yourself. Trust your own vision and use that as the fuel to catapult you to the next level. If your only why is I have to show you that you were wrong, whatever it takes to get it done because you deserve it and your kids deserve it, your family deserves it. So literally 57 days later, I fired my boss. Two months later, achieved the top position in the company. Within the next two years, I was earning a two strong- Two months later? Two months later, yes. Oh my God. 57 days to- to uh, leave my job. Two months after that, I literally fired my boss. I mean, I uh, got to the top position in the company. So four months in total. Wow. Within the next three years at the Millionaire Club and just moving forward with speed and boldness. But life was different. And I kept my kids involved. So my kids' friends were people, people's kids who were in business with me. So that even when I wasn't around, the store, the vision was supported. I, you know, if that makes sense. So not saying that you should brainwash your kids, but we are their parents. So we do have to frame their belief systems. We have to give them what they need to be successful here, right? The Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go and they'll never depart from it. And when I look at my kids today as adults, young adults, and I see their work ethic, their tenacity, their ball faced courage in the face of adversity, mm -hmm. it was all worth it. Mm -hmm. Everything I experienced, everything I went through was totally, totally worth it. Wow, man, I'm just like chills right now um, because I think that what, what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing and listening to is really a story that so many of us are in the middle of right now. You know, we have people who are new moms on our team. We have people who are single moms on our team, people who haven't even thought about their kids yet. But when they do have them, we know that a lot of what we're doing now is going to all be for that legacy, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that the part that becomes, um, you know, not just dreaming it, because I was reading a book earlier today and it was talking about how, we spend our lives kind of anticipating those exciting moments, like having kids, getting married, getting a degree, doing whatever. And then when it happens, it becomes real. And then that's when the sacrifice comes in. That's when, you know, everything is like 
just crazy all the time. Um, but when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about the conversations that I hit here over and over again. You know, a lot of people that come to our team, this is their first time in network marketing. So mm -hmm. the first thing that I wrote down when I was listening to you was just, um, you putting in the work, you getting to work. And we hear that all the time, but I know when I first started, I would hear that, but it didn't really resonate with me because I didn't know what that looked like. You know, so having someone to kind of show you in that Saturday what to do, you know, definitely put you in a position to do that. So I want to dig a little deeper into that around, you know, what is putting in the work look like? But then also the other thing that I heard you talk about was sacrifice. And I think that's something that when we do start telling people, okay, this is what it's going to take. You know, me and Fallon jokingly talk, say this all the time, but as we say, they see what we do, but they don't do what we do. Meaning, you know, I Insta, Insta story myself all day long. I share every single tip. And even with someone seeing what I'm doing, they're just not willing to put in that sacrifice. It's kind of like, oh, you work too hard. Or if that's what it's going to take to get to the Millionaire's Club, I don't think I got it in me. You know, so it's kind of identifying what the work is and kind of what this industry is and, and what that looks like. But then, okay, now that you've decided you're going to actually make this work for you or earn whatever that financial goal is for you or that freedom goal is for you. What does that sacrifice really look like? Um, you know, for moms and, and people with no kids alike, um, talk about that, you know, and I guess you can kind of give us your expertise just in a generic or general standpoint, since you didn't necessarily do it works, but now that you've kind of been in this company and you know, we all are pretty much the same in the industry, just kind of letting us know what is real work look like. So a couple of things you said a, a lot there. Um, and I'm, I'm going to address this one piece first, just to kind of get it out of the way. I am, when people look at me, a lot of times they receive me in a more, like a motherly kind of a more wisdom type of a role, right? Mm -hmm. So that gives me the opportunity because they know I care. Like I really care. Like I care enough to tell you the truth. I care enough to call you on your stuff. Like in a loving way, not to make you feel bad, not publicly, not to be critical, but because I really believe in you, even when you don't believe in yourself. So I tell people from the very beginning, like you don't have to believe in yourself because I believe in you. I got you. I got the belief part until you get your own. All you have to do is be open, be coachable, and be willing to work. That's it. Open, coachable, willing to work. Don't ask me too many whys. Just, mm -hmm. just do the thing and get the power. And you'll figure out. You'll understand the why you have to do it that way as time goes on. So when people say to me, I don't have it in me, I remember I was running for that position. And it was the middle of winter. I qualified in December. And we, in, at the time I lived in Virginia, and it was, um, we didn't have really crazy winters. But this was the first one in like 20 years. So I had a plan. I had a strategy. I had it all charted. I had it all mapped out. I knew exactly what I was going to do, who was going to sign up. And I mean, it included going to some businesses because I had some group stuff going on. And I remember getting up that day to go finish this month out strong and it snowed. Like my dad, my dad used to say, it's so butthole deep. Like you can't move around. You can't go anywhere. So I'm sitting at the house looking out the window, like, wait a minute, how does this work? I need X amount of people. I'm in the house. All of these businesses are closed. So my appointments are gone. What am I going to do? How does this work? But I had three more days in the month. The next day they came, they cleared the snow, it melted. I was like, okay, because I had more appointments. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to make this happen. Guess what happened? It snowed again. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the house like this. I had told people I was going to do this. I had changed the license tag on my car to the new title I was going to have. So I'm driving around in a car, perpetrating like I had this title, and I did it. <laughs> Like I was already, I had the pins, I had the gear, I was in there and it didn't look like it was going to happen. So I'm like, okay, I know from my personal development, from my reading that when you say can't and can't is foul language, you should never use the word can't period. It's foul language in the gym. It's foul language everywhere. It, when you say can't, your brain stops trying. 
you are talking yourself out of it right when you say, I can't, right? Instead of saying, I can't, how about I, there's a way. I just, I don't see it. I, I'm, I'm looking for the way. There is a way. Because now your brain continues to function, continues to move. And especially as women, a lot of times we're so emotional, we shortcut our own thinking mm -hmm. because we allow the emotion to step in and then it's just, you know, it's just a mess. You're not thinking clearly anymore. So learn to compartmentalize. Learn how to say, you know, if this sucks, I'm going to set it over here, but I got to go over here and still achieve my goal. I can come back to that mess. It's in the box. Nobody's going to steal it, right? Mm -hmm. So I sit her there in the house like, wait, if I'm at home, everybody else is at home too. So I literally put on my boots. I got my, my, my uh, big coat on. I got in my car with my bag and I literally drove to the people's houses so that I could get this done. Hmm. And I just remember and did it like literally got it done. As a matter of fact, when the announcement came, I was sitting in a one team, one mission type of an event. And everybody's like, you need to stay out there and get the numbers. And I was like, no, I committed to a process. I said, I was going to do this many events. I was going to be, and I have to stay on my strategy no matter what else happens. But it, I didn't give up. And you can't give up. Even when it looks like you're not going to achieve it, even when you're pretty sure it's not going to happen, you can't give up to that feeling, to that thinking. You know, um, Zig Ziglar calls it stinking thinking. You can't give up. You can't give in to those impulses. Your kids are watching. Your team is watching. People are watching. You've got to lead by example. You cannot be unwilling to do what you want other people to do. You can't. You cannot look. I said can't, right? You you cannot do that. It's 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 hypocritical, and you don't want to be that kind of a leader. So, say having said all that, though, if I'm working with someone and they have decided that they cannot and that they don't have it in them, as much as I love you, I don't have time to stay in that I can't space with you. Mm -hmm. So in the process of going through and trying to get qualified, there was a time where I was like, I just don't think it's going to happen. I, I, I just don't see how. And I called my upline and I apologized because, you know, he needed me to qualify for his next position. And I said, I apologize. I just really don't, I don't see it happening. I mean, I, I did everything I could. And he, you know what he did? He said, I can't want it more for you than you want it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And he hung up on me. Mm. Like he legit. Hang up sometimes. Hung up. <laughs> He legit hung up and I'm looking at the phone like, did you, what, did? so I called another one of my mentors and I said, look, this is what happened. Did I say something wrong? And he was like, you can still do it. Why did you give up? Why would you quit? I don't care how much snow is on the ground. You didn't say you were going to qualify if it didn't snow. You said you were going to do it. So get out there, get it done. I mean, and he was like, all right, so I'm going to go so you can get it done. And they did not play to my weaknesses. Yeah. And I think in an environment where we love, uh, we, we love each other, we want to be supportive, but we cannot love each other to our demise, mm -hmm. right? I got to love you enough to say, hey, girl, you said, and I'm just reminding you, like, for instance, when you get clear about somebody's why, you get clear about your own why, but the people that you're working with, you need to know their why as well. Why, not just because you want to get to know them because that's important, right? If you call yourself a leader and you have a core group of leaders and you don't even know their kids' names, you don't know what color furniture is in their living rooms, you got to question your leadership style because leadership is about building relationships. It's easy to leave a business. It's hard to leave a friend. It's hard to leave an environment that is considered your family. So you've got to create that for people who really don't have it out here. And um, so once you get clear about someone else's why, then it becomes that much easier for you to, to help them. You need me? Okay, this is live. I'm sorry. See, I told y'all. Did I tell you? I'm, I, I still got kids, grown kids. Okay. <laughs> but you've got to get really, really clear about what their why is and help them to be clear. So you can use that to inspire them because you can't motivate anybody. Did you know that? I cannot motivate you. By definition, you have to motivate yourself. Now, what I can do is inspire you so that you will move and get that thing done. So I had a lady, and this is the, one of the most absurd examples, but she was an older lady, had been working in the government for a lot of years, and her husband, they had a beautiful house, nice cars, you know, made a great income, but she didn't have any furniture in her living room. Her husband did not see the value of living room furniture. So she would not, he would not buy her any. First of all, 
let's talk about you not buying me some living room furniture when I want it. But that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> so when she came to the business, the most I could get out of her as a reason why was I just want living room furniture. Hmm. Okay, cool. So we run in, we making money so you can buy this furniture. And I called her and I said, um, before a training, I was like, hey, you know, I just want to remind you, you know, we have training where I'm going to see you. What time, you know, what time are you going to be there? Who are you bring with you? Oh, well, I got this going on and I got that going on. And, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it. That's what she said to me. You know what I said? I said, great. She said, what? I said, fantastic. She said, no, I said, I'm not coming. I said, I heard you. But you also said that you were going to do this business. You were going to go to these events and you were going to do this until you got living room furniture. So what color did you get? What style? She's like, well, I don't have living room furniture. I said, then I'm confused mm. because you said, I didn't say it, right? You said you were going to do what was necessary to make the money to get that furniture. If you don't have it, how are you not going to, how are you not going to show up at training? You, are, you obviously don't have it yet. She's like, silent. And she said, I hate you. <laughs> and I said, fine. She said, but I'll see you in the morning. And she showed up. Why? Because I used her own why to inspire her to move herself to make this thing happen. So you've got to be clear about your why. Share that with your, your mentors. Get clear about your team's whys so that you can help use that to inspire them, to motivate themselves to get this thing done. Then you got to know what your IQ is. And ask the people on your team, what is your IQ? When will you say, I quit? Mm. When will you give up? on your own dream. And let me tell you right now, if your answer is not, I will until, yeah, you might, you might want to do something else. Like, seriously, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but this is a, any, this is a life. This isn't just this industry or just this business in life. When you make a decision to do something great, you have to expect opposition. So while there is no opposition, while there is no over, you know, emotional, overly emotional type of situation, make a decision about how you're going to act so that when it comes, you can act in discipline and not react emotionally. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is this, if, if I said, I'm going to do this business until my kids start crying about me going to meetings, when they start crying, I can quit. But why would I, when I'm doing this for them anyway? The whole idea is to commit to the process, commit to sticking it out, commit to being here a year from now, continuing to do the steps to success. That's where you're going to see that massive increase come in your business. Okay. So get clear about your why, your team's why's, your IQ, your team's IQs, and then decide right up front, what are you willing to sacrifice? You're going to have to give up to go up. Something has got to go. It might be bowling night, right? It might be girls night out, not forever, but for a season. And when I decided what I was willing to sacrifice, do you know that those folks called me a sellout? They said I was selling out. And then three years later, they're calling a sellout when they need money. Right. You got what I'm saying? So I remember my girlfriend, she and I were both single parents. We were support. We were each other's support system. Super close. One of my best friends in the world. She looked at me and she said, you know what? This business isn't for you and it's not for me either. First of all, how are you going to tell me what's for me? And I, 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 I caught myself and I said, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for having the courage to say that to me because it took courage. But you don't see what I see. Like your vision is not my vision for my life. My vision is different. And if you want to continue to be supportive, cool. If not, step off, whatever you need to do, because I'm going on. I'm going to continue. And she did. She left my life space. Did that hurt? Yeah, it hurt real bad. I put it in a box, in the closet, and I figured I'd deal with it after I achieved my goal. And that's what I did. We went out there, got it done. Maybe three years later, after I moved from you know, the big house I lived in with my husband, the 2,500 square foot house, we moved to a 1,500 square foot townhouse. And then we built an 8,000 square foot home. She, mm -hmm. guess what happens? Her husband leaves her with her kids. She has no income, no money, and no business. Now who's she going to call? Me. And guess what I did? Y'all think I took her in? Yes. <laughs> Please. I told her red roof and left the light on just <laughs> for her. Right? <laughs> Of I didn't do that. I did let her move in with me for a period of time, but it was, it had, you know, it had structure to it. You've got to do X, Y, and Z. If you're not, nobody, you're not going to just live off of me. I'll give you, I'll assist you, but I'm not going to do it for you. 
And that's what a sellout does, right? I knew I wasn't selling out. I knew I was just running ahead, getting it done so I could come back and help save the people who wanted to be saved. But I can't, if neither one of us can swim, we're going to both drown. Mm -hmm. right so sometimes you have to separate from people they don't mean to hurt you and be mean nasty and unsupportive they just often they love you so much they're afraid you're going to get hurt they don't believe they don't see what you see understand what you understand so they give you the best that they've got and sometimes it's negative so just suck it up it's just part of the process you stay focused on what your goals are so what are you willing to sacrifice like i told you in the beginning i had these full-time type responsibilities at church i'm a marketplace minister today my dad is a pastor and I had like full-time responsibilities at that church. It wasn't even my dad's church, but I went to that pastor and I said, look, my kids are not even eating. Not, I mean, I am struggling showing up at people's house so my kids can have dinner. That's not a good testimony. I said, so I need 90 days. I need 90 days to get my life on track, to get the financial thing. So I'm not leaving the church. I'll be here every service. All this other stuff I'm doing in the background right now, I just can't do it for these 90 days selling out right 90 days later i achieved the position i came back like i said i would now the radio broadcast is about to go off the air because they don't have money they needed 13 13 thousand dollars or whatever it was twenty one thousand dollars and they gave you know everybody gave in the offering i didn't give in the offering on that sunday I called that pastor on Monday and I said, well, how much did you get all the money? And he's like, no, I said, how short are you? It's a little over 10 grand. I said, don't worry about it. Where do I send the check? Why? Because I was courageous and willing to take a risk. Hmm. And I got out there and I put work behind my, my words and things changed. So you got to be willing to sacrifice some things and no, granted people were not excited about the things I was sacrificing, but it wasn't their life. <laughs> it was mine, right? It's your life. You have to make the decisions of what's best for you and your family. And then fourth, fourth, get clear about who's counting on you. There is a group of people that you were created to serve. When God created you, there was a group of people whose problems you were created to solve. You need to be real clear about who those people are so that you realize until you get your stuff together, somebody is suffering. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your elderly parents. Maybe like my daughter, oh my gosh, she has this thing for, for um, homeless, hungry people. So that even when she would go to school as a high school student, she would come home every day hungry. Why are you hungry? It was because she was giving my money to the homeless guy so he could eat. Every day she did it. To this day, she has a ministry that does blankets and food and food boxes for homeless. They go out and they give stuff away. She was counting on me to be able to do that. She's, your kids are counting on you to believe they can do anything that they put their minds to. They're literally watching you more than, you know, more than hearing what you're saying. All right, if it's them who's counting on you, their face should be on your cell phone. It should be on the visor in your car. So every time that you are supposed to go to a one team one mission, every time you know that you're supposed to do two a day in terms of your blitzing and you don't feel like doing it, just go ahead. Look at your phone, pull that visor down and tell your child that they're just not worth it. I'm mm -hmm. too tired. You're not worth it. It's not important enough to me to get it done for you. Whoever that is that's counting on you. And I tell you what, it will change your worth, your work ethic. You'll approach the business and the things necessary to do this business successfully in a totally different manner when you get clear about those four things. I love it. I love it. Man, you really just laying it on thick. Um, so take us kind of into that, you know, you're looking at your kids on the visor and you're like, okay, it's go time, you know, connect the dots for some of those people who are just not understanding how to really break through that to that next level. Okay. So when you first get started, your list of 100s normally has what the people that you know, right? It's your warm market pretty much. And they often end up being the people that you practice on because they're not always going to be open. They know too much about you, but it's okay. Cause you're getting, you're sharpening your craft, getting better at your skill. Um, a very big thing that I did to get the people in, cause this is a people business is, um, I did a lot of blitzing prospecting going out. So when my kids were getting ready for school in the morning, I got dressed also. 
Once they left and got on the bus, I got in my car. I went and picked up my girlfriend or vice versa. And we literally drove around meeting people. You know, on my live yes, uh, this morning, I talked about, um, you know, blitzing two a day if you're part-time and five people if you're full-time so that you can, by the end of the month, have you know, a certain number of people who you've shared this information with. You can see the chart on my, on my Facebook page. But what I knew is that if I wanted it to pay me like a full-time position, I had to do the work of a full-time person in that business. It's funny how we'll do more for somebody else's business than we'll do for our own, right? So I got up every day and we would go and we would meet people. We'd stop them. We would talk to them. We'd go to the bookstores and just have conversations with people. And what we were really doing is building our list so that we always had someone to follow up with. There was always somebody else to talk to people in various stages of their decision making. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy because then, you know, you have to go home and still be mom after your work day, right? And then you might have an event in the evening, but it was worth it. That's why you do it. So it was, um, we did sit downs in public places. I didn't like going to people's houses to do sit downs. I would prefer to do it at the restaurant at a Popeye's or a Starbucks. Why? Because I could talk loud enough that the people at the table next to me could hear me. And often that was just enough to spark interest so that then I could get them on my list as well. Like literally. Um, we, we did a lot of follow-up. See, we didn't have social media then. Um, we did a lot of, and, and so what we did instead of having access to these huge numbers of people at a time, everybody that sat in front of us represented hundreds of people that we didn't know. But if we could get through them to those people by way of referral, then guess what? Those were other people that got added to the list. And it works like a pipeline. When you've got all these people on your list on this pipeline, then eventually they start coming out of the bottom, signing up, purchasing products, getting your services, and doing the thing. But it was more, it was so much belly to belly. It was so much getting to know people and connecting with people. That's how you can have, you know, an organization with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in it. You know, lots of people making six figures, lots of people in various stages of development, but you always had somebody to work with to help you you know, as you're helping them, of course, you're helping yourself to get to another level. So it literally was mastering the mundane, doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the beauty of that, though, is I already knew if I needed 10 people to sign up, I knew how many people I needed to talk to. You know, Jim Rohn says that if you do anything often enough, a ratio will appear. Some of us haven't done it often enough to even have a ratio up here. We have no idea. If I need, you know, 10 new customers, how many people do I need to talk to to get them? Do you know? If you don't know, I mean, you're a business owner. These are the kinds of things you need to know. How many people do you have to talk to to get a new distributor? So if like, like with the promotion that's going on now, you need one new distributor to help them get four customers so they get that $500 shopping spree. Well, how many people do you need to talk to to get one distributor? 10, 15, 100, and are you willing to go through the no's, whatever that number is? You know, we get so hung up on people saying no to us, like it's personal, it's really not. You know, in this business though, rejection, it should be your vitamin. Hmm. Rejection is your vitamin. You know, some people say some will, some won't, so what next? I say some will, some won't, so what? Somebody's waiting, and that's who we're looking for. We're looking for the people who are waiting. And it might take some folks to get through, go through some folks to find them. But when you find them and they get started, it'll change the face of your business. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mastering the mundane. Um, you know, and I can even say that's one of the things that really excites me about this business because in, in full transparency, four years later, I still haven't mastered the mundane. And to be able to make over a million dollars still just being a rookie Man, when I become a master, <laughs> you're gonna have to like go through a couple of lines to get to me because I'm gonna be like, Who is this now? Are you a there? Oh, okay, bye. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's just so exciting because I had no experience in this. You know, many of us start out having no experience, but when you do just commit to doing the same thing over and over, finding that ratio. You know, like I used to have a ratio um, and I realized uh, 
over the summer when my numbers was going down, it wasn't because of the work that wasn't getting done in the summer. It was because the ratios that hadn't been met the months before, you know? And so a lot of times I'm communicating to people how important it is to put your work in, put your numbers in so that you can hit that, that one person when the promotions come. I love that. So um, let's switch gears a little bit and kind of talk about it works as a company um, because I was actually um, doing some prospecting myself last night and um, a girl, a, a, a friend of mine from college, she was like, yeah, I'm thinking, I had been thinking about doing It Works, um, but honestly, you know, I, I watched your success. I would love to be at home with my daughter, but it just feels like I've missed the bandwagon with, you know, being able to be successful with It Works. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of people in our circle do it. Um, and so then I go on and I'm telling her my opinion. You know, I'm pretty much like, I was like, well, you know, personally, I feel like it's a facade, you know, it's just our Facebook bubble looks like everyone is doing it. It's really not because if I go outside right now and give out a card, somebody hasn't heard of it. On top of that, if we look at the numbers, there's only one ambassador in the city of Atlanta and it's 3.3 million people. So it's still opportunity. If you compare it to an Avon that has millions of people and we only have a couple hundred thousand, we haven't even went in China yet. I mean, and I'm rambling and I was like, I'm rambling to you because I know you, but this is the exact conversation me and my my husband have that leaves us like jetting off from lunch because we're like man like we I only have one international customer only one UK customer and I've still made a million so just imagine what's going to happen when we start to expand so I'm telling her all of this and even still she came back and she was like yeah I know that there's opportunity she was like my parents were in Amway for years she said my parents make millions in Amway for years my mother was able to raise us at home because she did network marketing so I know it works but I'm just scared that you know the bubble is about to burst so it's a lot of people even that are part of the business that are still not convinced that it works can be their first million or their second or whatever you know what I mean so can you kind of talk about why you having had success in the industry decided that this was a good fit and kind of give us some hope as to where our company is going and where we you know where we stand so when I um, I actually left that company because the founder died and it was purchased by a New York investment firm and the whole culture of the company changed it it stopped being about people and it started being more about the money and I was um, I had my organization in the field and I had a corporate position also and I just started seeing some things that made me uncomfortable and I literally was like Lord how do I what do I do because I'm telling people this is a safe place you know to be and I'm not a hundred percent sure that it's that way anymore and the things that I was seeing I wasn't comfortable with and that's why so what I did is I didn't make a big stink I didn't leave I didn't take anybody with me I just got quiet I still get paid from that organization. I just got quiet and for about five years, I was consulting with other companies, helping build compensation plans, making sure that we could market, you know, bringing new products to market and that kind of thing. But what I missed was you guys. I missed the people. I missed folks that were hungry for a change, that were willing to do what was necessary, that I could inspire, pour into, you know, teach, train, coach, mentor, you know, be there for, be supportive of. And I, I just really missed that. So when I heard that It Works was looking for someone to do just that, to literally fly around the country and connect with people. Um, and because like, I think you said it earlier, like your heart is for people. My heart is about people. It was just a good fit. So when I had the conversation with Cami and Mike, it was great. It went really, really well. But it was really when I went to the whole Nother Level event at Green Carpet. Mm -hmm. And I met the leaders and I saw the passion and I heard the authenticity and the hearts of those folks. And then sat down with Mark and Cindy 
And that sealed it because there are a lot of companies out there who are saying, you know, we have this level of integrity, we're operating in this character, we care about people, but they are literally paying folks to make sure that, you know, our arms are too short to reach everybody anymore. So they're literally paying people to come in and be an extension of their family so that everybody realizes that they are valued, that they have the support that they need from the Pentecost family. And that was huge for me. You don't find that in this industry. You don't. Most people are in it for the money or for themselves, but you don't have that here at It Works at all. Add to that, that um, first of all, It Works, the brand, the name of the company is amazing. Like that's a branding genius somewhere um, <laughs> that, that came up with that. But I also have, you know, um, knowledge of some things that are coming down the path. And because I like what I do, I really can't tell you all the details of those things. <laughs> but yes, we are getting some new products at the end of this month. We're going into some new markets. And I mean, all you have to do is kind of pay attention to things like, you know, they just introduced Margarita Vargas to support the Hispanic, the Latino marketplace. Mm-hmm. That's a clue, right, about where we're going. Um, hey, hola. <laughs> <laughs> there is a um, there is a company that we are absorbing whose products are super super legendary. Y'all don't tell nobody, okay? Um, actually, I think that's out there. That's out there. But yes, so there's so much coming down the path that is going to just make a sleeping giant um, in terms of the excitement for our company. Um, some new and exciting things. And um, I'm just really glad to be a part to help roll that out. Yeah, I'm being real careful because it's like, <laughs> girl, I'm, girl, I'm over here like, I'm, not, I'm like, shoot, who I need to call to get this info? <laughs> like, seriously, got to get in the underground. But I mean, God, like, wow. I mean, that's got to be amazing. I think that this would that would probably be like my like if I had to have like a dream position, it would be like. I want to be in the field, master the field, make tons of money. And then I just want to go and do like teach people how to do what I did. You know what I mean? Like what a great position to be in. Um, And, you know, I think that you hit the nail on the head when it, when you said that Mark and Cindy, you know, really want to create an extension because I kind of came in that second wave of um, people where it did become a lot for them. You know, like I, I told Prince um, when I hit number 10 in the company, I was like, you know, I don't really think Mark knows my name. <laughs> and he was like, how does that make you feel like that? Does that upset you? And I was like, I'm gonna be honest, it does, it does upset me. Like I made you all this money, you don't know my name, you know? But it's like one of those things where that just speaks to how fast this company has grown. When I started in 2013, you know, it was literally supposed to be a 90 day run and then I was gonna be out. but it works has been in momentum since I've been in and it really hasn't slowed up at all. And so to know that, you know, when I first started dash, which they phased out this year used to be all ambassadors and all presidentials. And then of course, by the time I got there, it wasn't that anymore. But every year I've watched just these little things happen that are just key signs to where we're going. And that's up. But then there's also little things that have so much opportunity for development when it comes to our technology, when it comes to our customer retention. And every time they announce something, it makes my business grow stronger without me having to work harder, you know? And so even little logistical changes can severely or greatly impact our success, you know? And so I tell people, you have to have a vision beyond today. You know, like we have strong products, but beyond beyond the products, we have a a a company that is built around people with integrity, and all they're doing is bringing in more people with integrity and skills, right? Not just people that can talk the talk, but people that have like the fact that all of you all have been top earners in your company. You know, when I was talking to Aspen, and she was like, "Yeah, I was number one in my company." I was like, "Okay, girl, I see you." You know, but <laughs> to just hear you, you know, and I think that that's genius. Like, go and get the top players from other companies, bring them here, and teach my people how to make money like you did. 
I mean, that's genius. Yeah. You know, and so these are the things that distributors don't they don't recognize because all they're thinking is like, oh, you know, do the raps work. Ma'am, why are we still asking that? We've been around 16 years, baby. If they didn't work, then we wouldn't be here. You know, we just came out with new better packaging. You know, it's just it's a beautiful opportunity. And I think that having you on tonight has just really kind of brought us back to really looking inward to figure out that why. You know, are we really hitting those numbers, recognizing our ra our ratios? Are we sacrificing? But then helping us to really think about that bigger picture, yes. you know? And I think that you are evidence of, like, where our company is going, you know? Not to mention that they finally got some melanin out there. <laughs> like, we've been waiting on this black girl magic in the house. Um, so... Anything else, you know, we like to keep our calls to, to right around an hour, but, you know, for those of us that are on the line tonight that, you know, you've really just spoken life into, are there, are, is there any closing words that you would want to share for us to just kind of move forward and finish the year strong? Yeah. Um, you know, this is, you know, we, we've heard it coined, this is the September to remember, right? And so what we have is on Saturday, it's Blitz Saturday, International Blitz Day. Mm -hmm. And that means that we're out there, we are building our list, getting the folks in position. Because understand, in, any, in, in the industry, anytime you start a real marketing push, it's going to take a little time for you to really see the benefit of it, 30, 60, mm -hmm. 90 days. So what we've got to do is go hard. For literally for about the next 90 days and it will carry you through Christmas through the first part of next year and into this into the spring season so we've got to get that list like really really beefed up so that we have people to talk to so we have people to share to put the rap on because like you said the rap works when people get the rap on my own child my own daughter Works out all the time. She's really cute, right? Really cute. Works out all the time. Is that her? It just came on. That was one of them. Okay. I have three. That's the baby girl. You see, she come put her head on my shoulder. Grown woman, right? I was about to say, I just imagine in my mind, I thought your baby was like seven, real sweet. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, though my great, I have seven year old grandkids actually. Oh, okay, black don't crack. <laughs> so, um, we got to get that list together because one of the things that was crucial for me is realizing that this year could be the year that you get your child everything they want for Christmas and don't go in debt mm. at all. Maybe there's something you wanted to do for your parents that you haven't been able to get in position for. You could literally make enough money between now and the end of the year to pay off all your debt, maybe except your mortgage and your car all your credit card debt, like set a goal about of how much money you're going to make and then get your leadership to help you back out what it is that you need to do to create it. Because the stuff that's coming down the pipe, you want to have people to talk to people to share the new information with, and then you want to, um, you, you, everybody's running. So you need to connect with people or not just a, you're a number on my list. What do I mean when I say that? If I approach somebody like, look, have you heard about It Works? Oh, not you. Have you heard about It Works? No. Get to know them. Hi, how are you? Compliment them. Connect with them. Get their information. And you know, you may not even say anything about It Works in the first time, in the first place. You know, feel it out. Give them the blitz card. But don't be pushy. You want to get them on your list so that they become a base for referrals for you mm -hmm. as well as a potential distributor and loyal customer for you. Yeah. Because as time goes on, you're going to want them in position. So you can call them back and say, hey, you know, I know you weren't interested in the wrap, but this product right here, based on what we discussed and what you said you wanted, this is going to help you get there. You've got to at least give it a try. But if you don't have anybody to talk to or, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. For those of us who are out there on Saturday blitzing and getting these names and numbers and building these lists, we're going to talk to your folks. Exactly. A week later is going to be the International Rap Party Day. Yeah. This is, and, and don't think of this and just, you're a leader. You're leading from the front. So yes, you're doing it yourself, but you want to think about it in terms of gathering your team around this fire. Mm -hmm. 
the numbers that I showed on that Facebook post that talked about if there's one of, if it's just you doing it versus if you have two people with you on the team doing it or 10 people, or the fact that you can reach over 800,000 people, you have a hundred people simply talking to two people a day for a year. Hmm. Come on now. Let's, let's get this thing done. Like there's no reason with leadership like you have mm -hmm. in Alina Conley and, and the others, there's no reason why I'm not talking to every last one of you, at least diamonds, mm -hmm. every last one of you on the way to double and triple diamond. You've got it in you. Mm -hmm. You've got the leadership. You've got the service. You've got the product. The only variable is you, me. I'm the only variable. If anybody's ever done it, you can do it too. And that's what you have to know, like with everything that's in you. I might make mistakes on my way to it, but I'm going to get there. And then I'm going to share with you the mistakes that I made so you don't have to make them. So get those, get those people in your pipeline. Get them in there quickly. Connect on a relationship basis so that you can then go back and offer them, you know, invite them to your rap parties or, you know, ask them to help you. Find out what a good referral is for them based on maybe their business owners. Maybe it's a real estate agent. Do you do rentals? Do you sell houses? What price range? You know, get be interested in what they're doing so that they don't mind kind of keeping you in the loop. So if they aren't ready, when they meet somebody who is, they'll call you and you do the same thing for them, you know, pay it forward. Yeah. So that's, that's the big thing. Like get people in front of this information, get people on your list so that at the end of the month, when these new products come out, you have somebody to talk to. Okay. So last, last tip. What is your best blitzing tip? Because we about to hit these streets on Saturday. And I know they're going to ask me, how do I blitz? So what's your best blitzing tip? Okay, so my team used to tell me that blitzing didn't work. And it was funny. Because I was like, how's it not working? If it works for me, it works for anybody. Um, so when you approach people, smile. Mm -hmm. You know, and if they don't smile back, that's probably not the person you want to approach. Go mm -hmm. to the next person. Don't waste your time. Um, don't look for the, you know, she was looking for the most sour faced people in the entire, you know, store. We went to bookstores, you know, to, to approach those people. Make sure that they're warm and friendly people that you would actually want to work with, mm -hmm. right? You actually want to build with. Um, and then, you know, but it's hard because you don't want to prejudge anybody either. If someone, if you smile and say hello and they say hello back and make eye contact, that's who you talk to. You know, if you give them the card, Mike Patilla does a great training on, you know, whatever they, whatever catches their attention on the card will tell you what color they are mm -hmm. so that you can address those concerns. Learn how to do what they call in Mary Kay warm chatter, you know, to be able to just talk to anybody about anything. And, you know, I hear it. I hear you. I hear you. Somebody said, but I'm shy. Well, I'm the shyest person you're ever going to meet. Really? I am only, absolutely. I am the only child of a single parent mom. I spent a lot of time alone. I like me, but what I realized is that shy didn't serve me. Mm. It didn't serve my purpose. It wasn't a part of my why. It didn't get my kids fed. So not to say that I don't still have my introverted moments because I do, my kids will tell you, but I know how to turn it off when it's necessary. And honestly, shy people often do better at prospecting than big personality people because sometimes that big personality kind of just like blows people over, kind of mm -hmm. scares them. Whereas mm -hmm. a, a more calmer, quieter personality is more, is more attracting, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. So get out there, be warm, be friendly, build relationships quickly. There's a book. I'm going to have to send it to you, Alina, the title of it. But it has something to do with how to build, how to make a friend in 30 seconds or less or something along those lines. Oh, okay. You might have heard of it, but it's really good in terms of what to talk about. Use the acronym FORM. Ask them about their family, their occupation, their recreation, their motivation. You know, the, what, just get them talking about themselves. I've talked to people and asked them so many questions that they don't know anything about me, but they walk away like, oh, I just love her. There's something about yeah. her. And I haven't said a thing. Yeah. Right. So you are in a people business. So you've got to study people, get an understanding of who they are, how they operate. And that'll help you. So yes, get them names, get those people. If you need a partner, get a partner, go together. It's easier to take a no and two, but do not go home on a no. Mm. The last person you talk to has to be a yes, where it was a good exchange. Don't go home on a no, because it'll be that much more difficult to get out the next time. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
can I just do a slow clap? Katrina, <laughs> like you don't even understand. My um my leadership chat is like going crazy. I can I'm going crazy. So I know they're going crazy. I just feel like awesome. I've been in the business for years and some of this stuff's just sounds like new stuff to go and try you know and i'm excited um for the team and i'm just so blessed that you have graced us with your presence tonight and and joined uh our family and we're just excited to have you so this is recorded in case you want to use it um i'll post it to my youtube tonight um but thank you so much. Thank you guys for joining. I will share the YouTube on the Facebook page. Uh, so no need to message me when we get off. Um, I'll be posting it late tonight. Um, and everyone have a great weekend and get out there and blitz. Thank you, Katrina. Absolutely. Love you guys. Appreciate you. Love you too. <laughs>